Welcome! So, this is XCOM War of the Philosophers. Here I'm taking two things I love and combining them. I love reading and doing philosophy, and I really love XCOM. XCOM's a really enjoyable game that's a lot of fun to play, and it encourages you to think and strategize about what you're doing. If you play XCOM like you do most strategy games like God of War or Call of Duty, you'll just get eviscerated pretty quickly. Now, I also really love philosophy because it's the pursuit and love of truth, and how can you not love pursuing and finding truth? And uh, it occurred to me that philosophy and XCOM are a little similar in that since XCOM's a strategy game where you're trying to solve the problem of how you complete the objective without getting all your guys killed, well, philosophy is a lot about problem solving too. You see all these various issues in life and you're trying to find ways to deal with and address them. Now, XCOM has a really great feature where you can create your own soldiers. So what I did is I put a bunch of influential philosophers from history and a few contemporary ones in the game. And now I'm going to do a playthrough with all these philosophers and we'll see if ideas really are powerful. We'll see if a bunch of intellectuals, abstract thinkers, and idea men can fight off an alien invasion. So I'll be getting started with Socrates here. You can see him there facing down the alien. It's pretty appropriate to start with Socrates because he was a hoplite in the Athenian army during the Peloponnesian War and he was apparently quite a soldier. I'm going to be using all the latest expansions for XCOM 2 up through War of the Chosen. I do really recommend that if you don't have this game and you play video games at all that you go out and buy it because it's a great game. I, but I would recommend that you get started with regular XCOM 2, or what some people call vanilla XCOM 2, as the War of the Chosen adds a lot of features and complexities that greatly increase the game's learning curve. They're good features and complexities that I really enjoy. It's just going to be really difficult for you to get started in the game. Also, well, I'm not going to be playing the tutorial through here. If you're just getting started, you should play the tutorial. Not just to help you learn the game mechanics, but also because there's some story elements in the tutorial that you don't want to miss out on. Each uh, playthrough episode I do will concentrate on one philosopher. I'll play about an hour of the game, uh, and then I'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes uh, talking about who the philosopher was and why they're important, and give you a few key ideas or points they made. I'm doing this mostly for fun, as it gives me an excuse to play XCOM for at least an hour every week, and that's an hour well spent that I'll really enjoy. Another reason I'm doing it is that I've seen quite a few playthroughs of XCOM 2 on YouTube, and well, they were pretty bad. The people making them seem to have very little conception of how to actually play the game. So if all goes well, watch a couple episodes of this, and then you'll understand how to play the game and can do pretty well at it. One of my hopes in doing this is first that a few people will actually watch it, but also I'm kind of hoping that if some people come for the XCOM they'll find that they really enjoy the philosophy, that's worth their time and they'll stay for it, or conversely that if some people come for the philosophy they'll find that XCOM's really worth their time and they'll stay for that. So with that being said, let's uh, set up the game here. I'm going to play on Commander difficulty. I have played on Legend before, but I'm not going to this time because I need the soldiers to stay alive so I can talk about them later on. I like leaving subtitles on, but you know, do whatever you want. The advanced options are uh, little modifications they've added in War of the Chosen that add a lot of variety to gameplay. Beta Strike there will make the actual battles last longer. The next three under that allow you to start at the different faction headquarters, alter the game a little bit, but that edits out some story elements that I like, so I'm not doing that. Grim Horizon makes the dark events permanent, makes the game a lot harder. Lengthy Scheme I'm going to enable because that makes the game last longer, and the longer it lasts, the more time I have to talk about the philosophers, do more episodes, that kind of thing. Uh, time Tuner makes some of the missions uh, easier. On some of the missions there's a timer counting down and you have to complete the mission before the timer runs out. And Precision Explosions make the damage at the edge of an explosion from grenades uh, take less damage than one at the, you know, in the center. So I'm not going to enable Iron Man mode. I have played it through with Iron Man mode and beat it that way before, but I've had some trouble with save game files getting corrupted, and since that only allows you one save game file, if that gets corrupted, 
you're just screwed. So I'm not doing that on this playthrough because I don't want to lose all the progress. I uh, actually like playing through the DLC missions, The Nest and The Lost Towers. I know it says that it doesn't integrate them very well uh, with The War of the Chosen if you just play through them like that. But I really enjoy these story missions and want to play them, so I'm going to keep them enabled. So now I'll shut up and let you watch the story. Accessing the feed now. We're in. But I don't know for how long. You seeing this? Way too much security, even for Advent. That's no ordinary gene therapy clinic. They were telling the truth. Or they're leading us into a trap. A really obvious trap. We'd need an army to march in there right now. I've got a better idea. Outrider, this is central. Go. Mistakes are bound to happen. It wasn't our fault. Please! There's no need for any of this. I will do what you ask of me. I just need additional time. Did you say something? You're one of those. You must understand. I had no choice. Outrider. Report! So... You do exist. Outrider to Avenger, I have visual confirmation. Are you sure? Reapers are always sure. I'll take your word for it. Cover your tracks and get the hell out of there. They can't know we were here... yet. Understood. Now the real war begins. Excitement continues to build as city centers across the globe prepare for the 20th anniversary of Unification Day. Thousands line up at the site of the Great Accord, celebrating the formation of the Advent Coalition. In keeping with their promise to humanity, 12 new gene therapy clinics will be opening in select cities by the end of the new year. Despite the attempted attack by fringe elements, operations at the new facility in Paris thankfully remain unaffected. In response to the unprovoked intrusion on the eve of our most beloved celebration, the speaker reaches out to us. A small number of dissidents again repeat the mistakes of the old world. Striking as we celebrate the benevolent savior who time and again offers only friendship and compassion. Yet these trivial actions could never break the bond between humanity and the elders. Peacekeeping forces have already made several preemptive arrests of known collaborators. Advent again assures all citizens that today's celebrations will continue as planned. Perfect. The Advent Administration reminds you to report all suspicious activity to your position. You were right. Definitely got their hands full today. Stay focused. Prep gate crasher. 60 seconds. Watson! <laughs> 
See what we got here. There's Socrates and Nietzsche sitting across from him. I didn't quite catch who the other two philosophers, soldiers were before the camera went in, so let's pull back and see what we're getting started with here. I think that's. Oh, there we go. That's Pascal and. Zeno. Zeno's kind of an odd character, both in history and in the game. Venice one five. We have a fix on the target. Move to place the X four charges at the designated position. Okay, so yeah, we've got the Ubermitch, Nietzsche, uh, Zeno, who's paradoxical. Nobody really knows exactly what he looked like, so I uh, made him look pretty weird and wacky, although actually the one description of him sa says that he was pretty pleasant looking. Uh, Socrates, I only know nothing. And Blaise Pascal, who's famous for his wager. Now, uh, the actual XCOM game, it's uh, set 20 years after an alien invasion where the aliens won. It's a turn-based squad game, so you can see that's my squad there. And it's turn-based in the sense that I'll take a turn, then the aliens will take a turn. And unlike the previous one, in this one, most of your missions you start in cover. Or, excuse me, concealment, meaning the aliens don't know you're there, you get to run guerrilla ops. So, what you're seeing there is if I had Nietzsche run over and jump down through the glass, he'd make the noise and alert the aliens that I was there. Uh, the main mechanic in this game is aim. Let's see here. There we go. It's aim versus defense. And you don't see a defense up there, but I'll get to that in a minute. So, Nietzsche right now has 65 aim, meaning he's got a 65% chance to hit something he shoots at if there are no other factors. Where the defense comes in is some characters, uh, aliens, and sometimes your soldiers will actually have a defense rating, but mostly it comes in with cover. What you're seeing here, those little symbols, that means that's half cover, which gives you 25%, and that one right there is full cover, which will give you 40%. And cover is really the way that you absolutely survive this game. Uh, the, a good rule of thumb is always keep your soldiers in cover. It's, it'll keep them from getting killed very, very often. Now, if soldiers get to have two actions per turn. The blue line here represents one of Nietzsche's turns. The yellow line represents the extent of it. So the, ex the problem, trouble is firing just ends the turn completely. So if I had Nietzsche just throw his grenade right now, his turn would be over. He wouldn't get to move again. Likewise, he you... He could move up here and fire, but he couldn't move up here and fire because then he would have all his actions taken. Now, there's two very general strategies people take in XCOM. The first is to, uh, hang on, here we go, to bump up your aim set setting so that we could get Nietzsche up to, say, with certain strategies and certain modifications and things like that, say, bump him up to like 85 or 90, and that way more of your shots are gonna hit. The second one is to increase what they call your critical chance, which boosts the chance that you're going to do more damage, and you'll get to see that more as I put these guys into action, because that doesn't show up until you're actually 
bearing down on somebody ready to fire. Now, they're both actually, I think, legitimate strategies. I've heard people argue between them, but I think they both work. Um, you usually can't do them both at the same time, but when you can, that's really, really uh, wonderful. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, well, I think that's enough mechanic talk for now. Uh, so I'm going to take a drink of coffee here, and we'll get going and see what we can do. Now, generally, um, as well as keeping them in cover, uh, it's best to move your soldiers up one move at a time so they can provide help and cover to each other. So rather than running Socrates all the way up there, I'm just going to move him up here. Okay. And that way, if they stumble across the aliens you'll, and you don't expect it, you'll have some more freedom as to how you react. You won't get, you're less likely to get caught off guard. And then I'll move Zeno up and have him ending cover somewhere up here. Let's see here. So that's our target, and we've got two tall buildings. I think, yeah. I'm gonna stick two guys over on that other tall building and keep two guys on this one. Oh, there we go. the bulk of the advent forces we've dealt with. They're disciplined and well equipped, but their obedience makes them predictable. Well, now, after I see those guys over there, I don't think that's the best strategy. I'm going to put two guys up on top here, and two guys over here. And the reason I'm doing that is, uh, if you're higher than the target you're shooting at, that gives you an uh, aim boost. And especially very early in the game like this, you need all the aim boosts you can get, because your soldiers are pretty worthless at the start of the game. Although Nietzsche would probably say he's not worthless, it's just us imposing our weak morality on him. Oh, the aliens didn't even move. Okay. So I can put... Yeah, that should work. Jawohl. Menace 1-5, you're near the target position. Okay, I'll put Socrates right next to him in cover. And I'll show you what I mean here. Pascal has uh, 88 and 87 chances on all these guys. And you're seeing there, the height advantage gives him a 20% boost, and then he's got a 3% boost because he's a little close. And those are actually pretty decent odds, but I don't want to attack yet. I want to wait until all my guys are in position so they can all take shots at the same time. And he's got about the same. Socrates and Nietzsche might have slightly better odds because they're a little closer. We'll see. Yep, 90, 90, and 89. Alright. How close can he get without... I wonder if I could flop a grenade at these guys. What's the range on the grenade? It's three right now. I'd only be able to hit two of them, and it's three to four. There's a small chance a grenade might kill them, but usually, especially early in the game like this when things are harder, if it says the grenade does three to four damage, it's only going to do three, which means it would, I could only hit two of those guys and it probably wouldn't kill them. So I think my best bet is I'm going to put three of them in overwatch. That way, when these guys move, they're going to shoot at them, and then I'm going to have Nietzsche shoot at this guy. And hopefully between the four of them, they'll manage to take this whole squad out. Let's see. Here we go. Nice. There we go. Get him. Come on. Very nice. Good deal. We didn't even need all four shots. 
That was beautiful. Perfect, perfect uh, ambush. And so now, uh, everybody who got a kill is going to get a promotion and see what they are when they get back. The other thing you probably saw is it said that Nietzsche earned an ability shot point for XCOM. Those come into play later. They let you add uh, extra bonuses to, uh, excuse me, they let you add extra bonuses to, and skills to, to your uh, soldiers when you build a training center. So you want to collect as many of those as possible. And you get them basically by pl playing the game tactically. You get them by doing things like uh, shooting from height and uh, flanking soldiers and executing ambush kills. But you, it's kind of into a little random how it gives them out. It won't give them to you every time you do that. So now I think the best bet here... I want to keep my, some of these guys here on Overwatch okay. in uh, a high position. Because I'm pretty sure there's another squad of aliens that I'm going to have to deal with here. And since these soldiers are really green and weak, I don't want them all down here where they'll lose the advantage. Roger. Yep, there we go. The Advent officers seem more capable than the grunts. We're not sure whether to chalk it up to training or a stricter mind control. Okay. Come on, Zeno. Give us another hit. Ah. Mancato. Well, this isn't good. Let's see here. Can you get back up? She out. Forty-five isn't good. See, he's getting that a forty percent reduction because of that high cover. Now, what I'm going to do is take him into Overwatch. And here's hoping. Get back to high cover. Yes. Okay, so these two guys are in Overwatch. Can you make a grenade toss? Get him. Well, there's a small chance. Generally, the best strategy in this game is to. You don't want to just wound uh, soldiers because your enemy soldiers, because they can still fire back. It's best to just take them out. And it's gonna, there's a small chance Socrates might be able to take this guy out with his grenade. If I can just get the, there we go. It's unlikely, but I think it's best to go for it in this case. There we go. Make us proud. Yes, very good. All right. Now hopefully you can hit him. Yes. That guy's got a little more health though, so. Ah. No. Oh, now Socrates is in trouble because he's gotten flanked. When the officer marks the soldiers, that gives an aim boost against them. Oh. So, Socrates is going to get wounded. He's taking one for the team, so to speak. 70%. Why is... Yeah, that, that shouldn't... That cover shouldn't really count. But, well, we're going to go down here and flank him. Flanking shots go give clear. you a bonus to both your critical chance and your hit chance. I'll show you what I mean here. His uh, icon down at the bottom turned yellow there because he's flanked. You can see if I'm flanking the target, I got a 40% critical chance. No, I can. Pr Let's see. Anyway, I can get Socrates in flanking position on that guy. He can... Nietzsche can probably hit that guy with a grenade from right there. Yep. And this should destroy his cover, even if it doesn't kill him completely. Yep. Perfect. So now he's in the open, and he should be easy prey. Does everybody have a promotion? Yes, alright then. 
Let's just give this one to Socrates. Since he's the one who the guy hit, let him take a little revenge. Area is secure. We're not picking up any inbound contacts. Scanners are clear. Menace one five. We have a limited window to act before Advent responds. We need to get those charges planted on the double. Yeah, yeah. So even though I killed all the aliens around here, I still need to finish the mission by planting the explosive. And here we go. Menace one five. Rendezvous at the extraction point. Status confirmed. Squad is clear. Detonating charges. All right, we made it through with no fatalities. And it's kind of silly, but I like taking the mission photos. What? What is Socrates doing showing us his butt? That's really weird. We should turn him around. That's better. Raise up and find. Ah, uh, that's fine. The one nice feature about all those photos you take is, uh, if later on you'll see them in the game, they'll show up as posters in uh, settlements and cities and things like that. It's actually pretty fun. According to Advent officials, recent attacks by dissident elements operating outside of the city centers have done little to slow the progress of Advent's ongoing development or outreach programs. Voluntary citizen emigration numbers are reportedly at their highest level in recent years. So they did pretty good. I don't know why it's saying we had 100% shot success because uh, we had those two Overwatch misses. I don't think for some, whatever reason the game doesn't seem to count those, although it should. And it looks like Nietzsche was our best soldier, so... Maybe he really is the Ubermensch, we'll see. I'm glad to see our new recruits aren't hesitating when it comes to taking out the aliens. So Socrates is going to be out of commission for 10 days. So that kind of puts a wrench in my plans for focusing on him, I guess. Specialists deploy robotic drones on the battlefield that can be outfitted for combat or field medic duty. Okay, so specialist's first ability is they get a little uh, aid defense thing, and now they can remotely hack stuff with that drone they've got there. Let's see what they turn Pascal into. Serving as our demolitions experts, the Grenadiers provide heavy ordnance delivery whenever and wherever we need it. So now he can launch grenades with his grenade launcher. Uh, grenaders are, in the early game are your best go-to guys. Uh, just blowing everything up is the really a great strategy early in the game before you're soldiers have a much training or skill. I think they're gonna make Nietzsche the sniper now. Oh nope. The Ranger or serves as our Zeno, excuse me. reconnaissance unit, capable of moving independently in concealment while engaging enemies at close range. Rangers get shotguns and swords and they're usually pretty useful. So that means they're gonna make Socrates the sniper here. Just like it sounds, our sharpshooters engage enemy targets with pinpoint accuracy from extreme range. They're also trained in pistol marksmanship for the occasional close encounter. And so now with squad sight that means he can uh, hit any target 
the squad mates can see as long as he's got a clear line of sight on him. And making Socrates a sniper is pretty appropriate considering how we did arguments and generally went about showing people that they don't really know much of anything, or at least not what they think they know. Alright, so I think this is going to give us some more story elements here pretty soon. Commander to the research labs. Impressive, isn't it? Capable of generating immense power, yet completely harmless to human life. If only the same could be said for the rest of the aliens' technology, Commander. Dr. Richard Teigen, Chief Science Officer. I am responsible for the entirety of our research here, as well as the procedure you so recently underwent. Welcome to my lab, such as it is. I'm not sure what Central may have told you, but we found something while removing you from the alien stasis suit. A device implanted directly in your occipital lobe. Had I access to the equipment available to me during my tenure at Advent, I would already know the precise nature of its function. However, given time and your approval, of course, Commander, I assure you, I will find out. Which brings to light an additional point. Though aspects of this facility are indeed impressive, I am but one man. Were you to direct additional support personnel and resources to me, I could substantially improve the speed of all our research. A farewell, Commander. Alright, let's see what we can research here. Modular weapons, hybrid materials, alien biotech. And... This early... well... What you, how you want to go about it kind of depends on what you're looking to do. If you're looking for a really quick victory, you'd probably want to start with alien biotech. Otherwise, uh, hybrid materials or modular weapons are fine. Um, modular weapons can improve, give you a slight edge in your weapons really early on, so I'm doing that. The more intriguing options available. We'll begin work immediately. I'll send word when a complete report is available. Now let's take a look here. Commander to engineering. How far down? Okay, good deal. That's not so bad. Um, this is there's really three modes in this game. The first is the battle one where you're commanding your squad. The second is this one where you're doing you some strategic stuff Advent here in the Avenger, and most of the strategic night, stuff here revolves the around these twelve rooms here where you're there's room for building facilities. facilities on board the Avenger, Commander. But we'll need more engineers to clear out space for construction. So, training center will. Uh, you can spend those ability points here, and it helps soldiers to form. When soldiers have formed bonds, that'll help them, which gives them additional ability. A laboratory will boost uh, science training speed, like that other guy was talking about. Power relays, plow, power stuff. Guerrilla tactics schools give you some additional options on the ba battlefield. Uh, workshop gets some drones to staff other things, and so other options will pop up soon. The only real key to this is these power coils here. That's where you want to put your power options because you get a huge power boost for doing it there. And you get two good power stations on these, you're probably not going to have to build anything any more power. And that's the, really the big deal there. You, so, if like it both of them were down here, I'd probably just say start the game over again because you're going to need more power very quickly. You can see there's 6 out of 15 here and these take 3 and soon you're going to have to build other ones that take more. Um, so, And this is just kind of random each time. So I'm going to start with that. Oh yeah. We need more. We need to recruit engineers before we can excavate. That'll come a little later. Let's see what else she has to say. Okay. Reworked your repulsors with some of the parts I salvaged from your old engine. Should fix that stabilization problem you had. Come on, Rover. It'll work. Commander! Getting our tech to talk to theirs is harder than you'd think. Lily Shen, Chief Engineer. At your service. You are probably expecting to see my father. In 
when all that's happened, I'm guessing Central didn't tell you yet. He's gone. Dad gave everything he had to get us this far. This entire ship is his life's work. I know he would have loved to show you around the place himself. He used to talk about you a lot. You can be sure I'm ready to finish what he started. Might not look it, but in here, I can fabricate pretty much anything you come up with. And with a little more help, well, you'd be amazed with what I can do. It was an honor to finally meet you, Commander. Alright, let's see what we... Uh, she probably can't build this much starting off You'd be with. Surprised yep. how big of a difference some of these things can make in combat, Commander. With a few supplies, I can manufacture anything we need in no time. Uh, smoke grenades improve the defense, but the trouble with uh, them is uh, the guy who throws it forks over his turn to attack, and it's usually more useful to attack than it is to throw smoke. Not always, but usually. Flashbangs disorientate enemies so they can't use their special abilities and it knocks down their aid, or excuse me, aim. That's pretty useful early in the game. And medkits are obvious, and I, you almost never want to send a squad out without med ki a medkit for the reason that if one of the soldiers gets wounded and starts bleeding out, you need a medkit to stop them from dying. We noticed early on that the Avenger has a tendency to dip we'll go back up to the, the bridge here and load without the engines engaged. Commander, good to see you on your feet again. Welcome to the bridge, the nerve center of our operation. The aliens have our entire world in their grip. Advent controls everything. Government, communications, industry, not to mention the military. And it's on us to take it all back. Resources and time are tight, Commander. It'll be up to you to decide how to best use both. The ship is yours. Commander, we're attempting contact with a local resistance faction known as the Reapers. These people like to keep a very low profile, so it may take some time before we hear back. While we're waiting, it might be worthwhile to scan the area for additional supplies and resources. You never know what we may find out there. Commander, one of our resistance contacts just tipped us off to a site that may be worth investigating. So this is the third screen mode you'll spend time on. This is the one you actually spend the least time on playing the game, where you move around the world map, going to missions, trying to collect data, and things along those lines. Commander. The Avengers' remote scanning capabilities will help us search the area for clues or other resources. It's going to take some time, though. We've got a lot of ground to cover. And here we go with modular weapons. Success, so occasionally in the game you'll be able to pick up loot from enemies that drop it, or buy uh, mods for your weapons. These are things like scopes or uh, stocks that will enable you to do a little damage even if your guy misses. And those really, really increase the effectiveness of your soldiers. They're not as good early in the game, but late in the game that makes a huge, huge difference. Magnetic weapons are the first uh, real upgrade where they do more damage, but look at how long that takes. So it's better to do this one. I had assumed you'd make that research a priority, Commander. I'll notify you as soon as the report is available. Uh, I would have th thought there'd be snow around us based on where we are on the map. Okay. Well, I guess it's. China, not Russia, it just, so, oh well. What did we get? An acid grenade and dragon rounds. Okay, that's not bad. Dragon rounds uh, set enemies on fire and do more damage, as well as setting them on fire, and an acid grenade just burns away. These are really useful for uh, heavily armored Let's go get some more supplies. Supplies are basically the currency in this game. Uh, 
Another important step forward in our research. So that's a... She can now build that vest. And that makes things easier. Plated armor is wonderful when you can get that. That's a huge step up, but we're still... That's even going to take even longer than magnetic weapons. I agree. That is an important task, Commander. We have enough to build something there. Uh, I'm gonna hold off on that, and you'll see why here in a bit. And there's some stuff coming up that will give me a few more options that are gonna be more immediately beneficial. Commander, ah, as the resistance go. continues to grow, we'll have a better chance of finding. Yeah, you usually get a. Three As it is, options with these, a potential target but to you're the really only going to get like one this early in the game. Oh, they're going to give us an engineer. Limited, That's so great. We'll have to move we really need one of those to help get us going. So let's Study go here. For the West Asian corridor. All right, let's see who else they stuck us with. Oh, Augustine. Well, that's a good. Addition. Okay, let's give Nietzsche the med kit we made. Really, this early in the game, you can give it to anybody, but uh, later, after he gets another promotion or two, he's going to be a lot more effective at using the med kit than any other soldiers, because these specialists are just better at that. They're uh, not only the hackers, but the medics of this game. Let's give Pascal the acid grenade. That's a good get early in the game. That'll be really useful. Now, I could give... You could give either of these guys, either Zeno or Augustine, the Dragon Rounds or the Flashbang, but I'm not going to do that because right now I th it's more useful the, for them to have a grenade that can destroy cover to open up op targets of opportunity for the other guys. Uh, you can see here everybody's got a lock symbol there. That's because the next uh, step up in the armor opens up another slot, and then things get a whole lot more useful. It, it gets a lot more easy, excuse me, a lot easier <laughs> when you have that extra equipment slot. So let's get these guys going here. Sky Ranger deployed. We're in the pipe. Five by five. There we go. Readings indicate that Advent just powered up some kind of psionic transmitter in this area. And if they're assuming no one knows about it yet, it shouldn't be that well guarded. If we can take it down quickly, Advent's operations across this entire region will be in disarray. Some of the loading ga times in this game are a little ridiculous, but at least in this case, they give you this nice little scene of your soldiers traveling in, getting a briefing to... Oh! That's a lot faster than I thought it would be. Good deal. Let's get going. I really wish it could have been... I could have had Socrates on this mission since this whole episode's supposed to be about him, but that's how XCOMs go, is you'll make the best laid plans and uh, watch them get destroyed right in front of you. has constructed a psionic transmitter in this area, tied directly into their primary network. Our intel suggests destroying it while it's still connected will severely damage their linked systems. Plant the explosives before they have a chance to pull the plug. So, in this type of mission, you've got these, uh, you can't see it very well now because they're not close. These, like, mini little transmitters, and they're powering the big one that you got to go destroy over here. So it says I got four turns to pull this off. For every one of those little ones I destroy, I'm going to get another turn. But the trouble is... Right now, everybody's in concealment. And the second I open fire, they're not going to... On any one of those, they're not going to be in concealment anymore. So that makes it a little more difficult. Before you guys complain, I'm not breaking my own rule here. I'm just... They're out in the open right now, but I'm going to end their t these guys' turn up in cover. 
reçu. Je bouge. Another reason you want to end the turning cover is that while you're in concealment, the aliens can't detect you if you're in cover. Je me dirige vers la position. As long as you've got some cover in between si you and the aliens, visuel. you'll be able to hold the concealment. Then they can only detect you if you move or they wander around the corner they and see you there. Our readings indicate that relay is feeding energy directly Yeah, yeah, that's what network. I just said. I'm way ahead of you, Tegan. It. It Tegan, whatever your name is. The transmitter. Oh, good. I'll be able to set up an ambush on those guys. Confirmed. Moving out. Oh, these guys are patrolling. In the last mission, they just kind of sat there until I came there in upon them. Usually the aliens actually do patrol around the map, though. Oh, Augustine's blocking the ladder so we can't get up yet. sure if I want to do it this turn or wait another one. Let's see. Looks like it's just the two of them right now. problem here is, there's a good... I'm pretty confident that there's more than these two guys on this mission. That they're almost, There's never going to be just two aliens to deal with on a mission. So I can have him go up there and hit him with a sword, which is going to be pretty effective, but there's a decent chance that another group is, is going to see me, and then I'm going to have two, maybe even three groups to deal with as soon as I do that. So I think it's better for me to come up here and I'm going to try and hit him with a grenade or a shotgun blast. Alright, see if you can knock him out, Zeno. Ah, missed. Hopefully that'll be okay with the two guys up there, though. We'll see. They both have good odds of hitting. Perfect. Beautiful. There we go. Team gets a promotion off of that. And we'll have Nietzsche hit that mini power transmitter, or psionic transmitter, excuse me. Well done. As we had hoped, the network separation has been temporarily delayed. Okay, so now we've lost our uh, concealment. Oh, one of them dropped loot. Great, good deal. So, I think yeah, that's going that way will probably be our best bet, but we're going to move up cautiously because that's the best way to do it. Especially since we don't have concealment anymore. Yeah, that too means I've got two more turns to uh, collect that. Yeah, go ahead and take that out. Give us some more time. For some reason, every time you're firing on a fixed thing like that, you're just guaranteed to hit. Solid copy. It's a lot more useful, I guess. Oh, good deal. Scope and a laser sight. Position 
Okay, to reload. And no, I changed my mind. We're gonna go through that door. So move up to join the squad, Nietzsche. Yeah, that's good. Two more to run there to deal with. Position confirmed. Okay, so who's a lot of people I've seen play this game, uh they get very, very aggressive early in the game, and they get destroyed. Um, and you don't want to do that, because XCOM is kind of an odd beast in that the hardest point of the game is really the start. Right now, the first couple missions are just the points where it's absolutely brutally difficult, because you just don't have much in the way of options. These soldiers do not have any other options for, except really to shoot, grenade, and that's about it. The longer you go, the more training these guys get. It gets easier. And that's part of the reason why I'm being so cautious here. So I'll put Nietzsche in cover. He's gonna take out that one. And I'll put Augustine and Pascal in Overwatch. The reason I did that is uh Xeno's shotgun loses its effectiveness at range pretty quickly, like a real shotgun. So, guys with shotguns, especially early in the game, they're pretty useless at Overwatch. So there's a decent chance... Ah, Pascal missed. But, there was a decent chance he would have hit, but Zeno never would have hit that shot. Let's see if Augustine can do anything. Oh, Nietzsche's gonna get a chance shot. No, he missed two. Oh no. We got reinforcements incoming, so we gotta deal with these guys quickly. Okay, so we've only got two of them. Oh, are you kidding me? He's out of range for a sword attack? Pascal up, he'll be in range. Looked like Pascal was blocking his. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this is... Sectoids, these aliens here, they're vulnerable to sword attacks, so this should work pretty well. Let's see. Yeah. I was hoping he'd take him out completely, but no such luck there. Moving to designated coordinates. Really? Oh, we must be flanking him. Yeah. He's probably going to be exposed, but that might not matter if we can get them all. Let's see. 69 and 40. And you've got... Alright. They're just spread too spread out for me to get them both. Positioned its guys really smart. Uh, the other key point with this game is you can take your time figuring out what to do. There's n absolutely no reason to rush through it when you get in these situations. So, this is my best bet. Make us proud, Augustine. 
Beautiful. So then you can take out this sectopod with a grenade. Just make sure we don't hit Xeno. And that'll leave Nietzsche to fire at the incoming uh, reinforcements there. They're going to drop down by that red flare. Wonderful. Now what do we got? Two regular advent soldiers. Oh, three. And a commander. Take one of them out. Come on. Well, at least you did some damage. And they all really spread out, of course. Advent has almost cut off the transmitter from their network. We're running out of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you get... Let's see. 88, 88. Oh, you can get in there and flank him. Excellent. Now, I'm going to put him here because that's going to allow him to flank that commander as well as block him from shots from those other two guys. Take him down. You missed that? Seriously? You've got to be kidding me. Okay, we're going to be fine with this guy, because the acid will continually damp. Acid is good in that it continually damages the guys it hits. So even though it didn't kill him, it probably will on the next turn. So now you need to hit... Three to five. And Ichi's got a 70% chance there. you can get to flanking position on the commander. No. Okay, so you gotta hit him. Come on, Nietzsche. You guys were doing so good, and now you're all missing your shots like you're a bunch of pre-Socratic sophists or something. You know, I, I expect better of the Ubermensch and all these great philosophers. And that's gonna leave him exposed no matter what I do. So one of these guys is going to survive. I have to decide if it should be the commander or this guy. And there's a chance the commander will do stuff other than shoot. Uh, like he might mark my guys like that guy did last time. So I think it's better for me to move him in here. Take this guy out with a shotgun. The sword might miss. Where this is 100% guaranteed. And look, I've got a... 50% critical chance, and it's guaranteed to do 4 damage, so this should absolutely kill him. Beautiful. Yep, and the acid kills him. Now we've only got the commander left to deal with here. And he ran away. Good deal. I did not expect that. Reload. And hit one of those for us. Give us more time. You do the same thing. Well, that turned out really well, even though guys missed their shots. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, you move into cover. Can you see the guy? No, the commander must have ran through there. Okay. Go into Overwatch in case he pops out, which he probably will. And you get there in cover and do the same thing. We got bought ourselves a little more time. Okay. 
Bestätigt, drücke aus. Yeah, take that one out. Give us more time. Oh, that's a long ways off. Affirmativo. Perfect. We're not picking up any more of those relays. That's all the time we're going to get, Commander. All right. Oh, the asset's going away, so I can move him up there, and I think I'm going to have him reload while we've got a little bit of a lull. Good to go. Okay, Pascal. Let's see. I think we can get you that close without risking seeing that commander again. Go to Overwatch. Okay, we don't have much more time. We're gonna have to move quick. So rather than going around through either of those doors, let's just try and go through. I love that you can do this in this game. Just blow up walls and go move your way through. Well, that's not good. Confirmed visual on the transmitter. Plant the X4 charges before they can cut it off from the network. I was not expecting there to be more than just the commander that over there. Not a lot of options here. for that. Take him down. Beautiful. Now I didn't hit the sectoid at first because there is a small chance that the sectoid will actually use his mind control instead of uh, firing some things a lot easier. Oh! I wasn't expecting that. That's wonderful. You got the same chance there? About there. Perfect. Move a little closer. Stay in high cover. And only a percentage point. Oh well. And you miss. Come on. I don't think he's going to fire at us from there, and if he does, he'll probably miss. So, let's put you in overwatch and see what happens. Yep, he's in his mind control. Oh, he resisted it. But now he's panicked, so he's going to run away and probably get himself in trouble. Oh! That almost never happens when they panic. Wonderful. Well, that was a good stroke of luck. We're not picking up any other contacts. Get those charges deployed. Raggiungo la posizione. All right, this should end the mission. No casualties, no fatalities, nobody even got wounded. Wonderful. That transmitter is history. Good work, Commander. We got pretty lucky with the shots they missed that something bad didn't happen. Oh, the fire's burning in the background. I like that. I think we need more dead aliens to get the effect we're going for. <laughs> Advent city centers are but one organism. When criminals such as XCOM strike against any single part, 
They strike at us all. While Advent outreach squads rush to provide... Yeah, Xeno really was awesome there. I was expecting uh, Pascal as a grenader to be my most useful, but... Xeno really kicked a lot of butt for us. talking about Socrates. This uh, won't make you an expert on Socrates, but it should give you some stuff to think about, and if you ever run into a philosopher, it'll give you something to talk about with him or her. Socrates was a Greek philosopher from Athens who lived from approximately 470 BC to 399 BC. Now, we've been, if you've never studied philosopher, you, philosophy, you've almost all, certainly heard of Socrates, and that's because there's a cultural mythos that's developed that Socrates is the father or the founder of philosophy. Now, strictly speaking, that's not true, as there were philosophers before Socrates, like Zeno, but the life and death of Socrates left such an impression on philosophy that every philosopher is defined by Socrates' life in that every philosopher before him is now called a pre-Socratic, and every philosopher who came after him is now considered a Socratic. Uh, the only other person I'm aware of who gets a uh, distinction like that is Christ, as we get the B.C. and A.D. distinction from Christ's life. Part of the reason Socrates gets this distinction is that he was a martyr for his philosophy. Part of it is that because he was the first of the big three, the other two being Plato and Aristotle, and part of it is that he was the first philosopher in Western history who we have a good record of showing a consistent use of a rational method to pursue truth, that is, doing good philosophy. Socrates was tried, convicted, and executed for his fellow Athenians for the charges of corrupting the youth in the city and atheism. Now, it's a little unclear, but atheism at that time could have simply meant that he rejected the Athenian and Greek gods and believed in other, another god or gods. The story in the text of the Apology is that the Oracle of Delphi told Socrates' friend that no man was wiser than Socrates. When Socrates heard this, he took it as a divine mission because he thought he was ignorant and so he thought he was not wise at all. So he went around questioning everyone who claimed to know something to see if he could prove the god right. He regarded this as a dilemma that he must solve because he both knew that he was unwise and he knew that the god could not be wrong. So Socrates questioned the politicians and found that they didn't know much of anything, which is still the case today. He questioned the poets and realized that they didn't understand their own writing, and it was the same for the craftsmen, priests, and so on and so forth. Hence, Socrates realized that what made him wise was not his own ignorance, but that he recognized his own ignorance. Everyone was ignorant, but only Socrates was wise enough to be aware of his own ignorance. So from that we get the Socratic maxim, I only know that I know nothing. It's in all this questioning, which we get a glimpse of in Plato's dialogues, that we see one of Socrates' great contributions to philosophy, the Socratic method. Simply put, the Socratic method is just asking questions until you find a satisfactory answer or conclusion. For example, someone might cl make claim like, say, crime is down this year, and so Socrates would ask how they know that. The person may reply that they heard it on the news, to which Socrates would ask how they know that they can trust the news. And that person might reply, well, because the news got its information from the government. And Socrates would say, how do you know the government is giving out good information? Well, they usually give out the right information. And if they usually give out the right information, is that a good reason to trust them this time? Yes, and there doesn't seem to be a reason they would lie about this. 
And Socrates would reply, and why wouldn't they lie about this? And so on it would go. Now, it's easy to see how questioning people with authority and power like this can get you into trouble. And here I'm going to make a distinction that Socrates doesn't make explicitly, but I suspect he recognized it and did make this distinction. That is, there's a legitimate purpose to this method, and there's an illegitimate one. If your purpose in using the Socratic method is to find a good foundation for claims that another person is making, especially if that is a person with power and authority, like a politician, a journalist, a religious leader, and so on, then this is a good and legitimate practice. It's probably going to tick people off, after all, it got Socrates executed. But if you find that someone has good reasons for the claims they're making, and then you accept that and move on, well, you've accomplished something good. Uh, the late great Dallas Willard once said that the purpose of good skepticism is to challenge illegitimate claims to authority, and I'd add it's also to challenge illegitimate claims to power. And the Socratic method is simply pushing people to think and give reasons for their claims, and that is good skepticism. We should all be skeptical of those with power and authority until we have reasons not to be. But if you use the Socratic method to keep pushing at someone despite the fact that he has given you good reasons for his claims, then you are just being a bit of a jerk and demonstrating that you really aren't interested in truth as much as you are interested in making trouble. Dallas Willard also said once that you can be as dumb as a cabbage and still ask why, and he's right about that. I've met some profoundly dumb people who keep asking why. So, but so suppose someone asks me how I know that I know these things about Socrates. I reply that there is a good and well-established historical record that tells us key facts and points about Socrates, and further that we have historical records of people in history engaging with those records. But for example, Aristotle wrote a little bit about Socrates. Some of the points are in doubt or a little messy, but we know many things quite well. The person then asks me how I know there isn't some grand conspiracy that just fabricated Socrates. So I reply that such a conspiracy would almost certainly have left behind some evidence of, existen of its existence, and there doesn't seem to be any such evidence. The person then asks me how I know there was not an additional conspiracy that's purpose was to hide the evidence of the first conspiracy. Well, at this point, the Socratic method is obviously no longer being used in a legitimate way. And I used pretty benign examples of, you know, a positive and negative use of it, but it's pretty easy to imagine some not so benign examples of both a good and a negative use of it. Now, in the literature on Socrates, you're generally going to find him portrayed in two distinct different ways. One is a, a man of such integrity and honesty that he refused to give up rational inquiry in the face of death and was condemned because he was exposing the hypocrisy and the ignorance of the powerful. The other is as an annoying jerk who will just never accept an answer and keeps asking questions long after it's passed being useful and meaningful to do so. Now, as long as the goal of the Socratic method is the pursuit of truth, then it is a great tool of inquiry. And in my reading of Socrates, I think that was his goal, but other people think he was really just a big jerk. The only other problem with the Socratic method is that sometimes it will push us into deep and very difficult philosophical territory. Professional philosophers to this day debate exactly what it means in the absolute sense to know something, and that's because in the strictest possible sense, knowledge is that very hard to define. We all seem to know what it is to know, until someone asks us to define it. But the fact that someone cannot tell you exactly what it means to know something, or how he knows something, doesn't mean that he doesn't know it. I don't need to know how my eyes work in the biological sense in order for me to see the things that are right in front of me and be quite reasonable saying these things are right in front of me. So, the Socratic method isn't a perfect method because it requires that both participants be honestly searching for the truth of the matter, and as Socrates found out, many people are simply not actually looking for the truth of the matter. They're more interested in power or various other things. So, at his trial, Socrates denied the charges of atheism by claiming that he believed in divine things, therefore he must believe in the divine. There is some reason to think Socrates didn't believe in the Greek pantheon or that he was skeptical of the Greek gods. For example, the Oracle of Delphi was considered the Oracle of Apollo, and yet Socrates never says Apollo sent him on his mission of philosophy. He says that God or the God sent him on the, his mission of philosophy. This is odd because it seems that all he would have had to do to refute the charges would have been to claim that Apollo was the God who sent him on his mission. 
This would have refuted the charge if we take atheism to mean the belief that there is no God, and it also would have refuted the charge if we take it to mean that he just didn't believe in the Greek gods. And yet Socrates didn't do this. Now, this has led some people to speculate that Socrates might have been a monotheist of, monotheist of a kind or another. So Socrates addressed the charges of corrupting the youth by claiming that no one will ever intentionally corrupt another person, as that corruption will in turn harm him in time. This comes from another one of Socrates' odd maxims that all men seek the good. Socrates argued that everyone really does try to pursue good, but they make mistakes and end up doing evil out of ignorance. Now this is an odd maxim as it seems fairly obvious that it is not true, because we've all observed many people who seek and do evil. Just read a history book. Just look at the news. Just look at the evil the Athenians did to Socrates. But we can make this more plausible by saying, everyone does what seems good or best to them at that time. This seems pretty plausible, and I think it's more in line with what Socrates actually meant. He thought that virtue was found in knowledge, and this goes hand in hand, these two ideas go hand in hand together. If we all do what seems best to us at the time, then the solution to evil is knowledge, as then we will have enough knowledge to recognize what really is good and bad, not what just seems good to us at the time. After Socrates was convicted, he got to propose his own punishment, and he suggested that his punishment should be that the city would give him free meals for the rest of his life. So he was doubling down on his plea of innocence, even in the face of being convicted. And again, this can be interpreted as a man who just has so much integrity that he will never waver, yield, or back down no matter what anyone does. Or you can read it as him persisting in being a troublemaker and a jerk. So instead of giving him free meals, his fellow citizens voted that he should die by drinking poison. And that's just what happened. Now, there's a whole lot more that can be said about Socrates, but the only th other thing I'll mention is the Socratic problem. And that's that Socrates himself wrote nothing down. The knowledge we have of him comes from his students and contemporaries who did write about him. There are several different sources, but Plato's Socrates is the most interesting, as he says the most. He speaks in 28 out of 30 Platonic dialogues and seems to provide the best picture both for its vivid portrait of Socrates' character and for its philosophical depth. However, at some point, Plato stops accurately reporting on Socrates' own ideas and starts using Socrates as a mouthpiece for his ideas. And the question here is not if Plato did use Socrates for his purposes, because he absolutely did. Rather, it is where in the dialogue this change occurred and if it was gradual or abrupt. Exactly when this occurred and which dialogues can be described as Socratic or mainly Socratic, or mainly Platonic, or wholly Platonic has been debated by scholars for generations. Now I mention this because the Socrates that you'll read in, say, the Apology or Euphoro seems to be very different than the one that appears in later Platonic dialogues, and as much as can be done, I've tried to separate what most philosophers and scholars agree are Socrates' own contributions to philosophy from those where Plato just uses him. So, to learn more about Socrates, go read the Apology. Uh, the philosopher Peter Kreeft has said that no civilized human being should ever be allowed to die without reading the Apology. And while I think that's a little strong, I'm, I'm, I mostly agree. It, that's, it's a great work, you should really read it, and it's not even very long. You'll learn a lot and it's pretty short. You can easily find it online along with the rest of Plato's dialogues. There is also a great book on Socrates by Paul Johnson that I recommend. And you can find information on Socrates in pretty much every philosophy encyclopedia or textbook. So now, what do you think? Was Socrates a man of fierce integrity, or was he just a jerk who wouldn't leave people alone? Was he really that wise if, by going around asking all these questions, it got him killed? Or did he die as a martyr to the truth? And are his maxims right, wrong, or just confused? So next week, we'll pick up XCOM War of the Philosophers again with Socrates' student Plato. And of course, standard YouTube ending stuff, you know, like, leave a comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Thanks.